<laughs> uh, my name is Nick, and I'm going to talk to you about um, turbulence responding to turbulent machinery. I just I knocked this together. It's very simple. There's no features. Lots of maths. Um, don't pay attention to the math, though. You'll see. Um, after John Denton's talk yesterday, I thought, well, I know a little bit about this stuff, so I'll come and give you a bit of an extension to what he was talking to us yesterday. Um, so the question is a bit of revision. Why do we need turbulence modeling? Well, basically, this is the equation that we deal with. Uh, in this case, I'm using the incompre uh, incompressible net stokes because compressible equations are too difficult for turbulence modelers. We can't deal with them. They're too tricky. So we, we take the in incompressible net stokes and we just go look at the momentum equation here. We take the momentum equation, we do a Reynolds decomposition, so we basically break each quantity of interest into a fluctuating mean part. The reason we do this is because we can't possibly hope to resolve all of the scales in time and space that's going on, but it's, we're, luck, we're lucky in the sense that when we're looking at an aircraft zone, we're just interested in what's the force, what's the lift, what's the drag, average in time. So as long as we can get that, we're happy. So we, we try to find an equation for the average, and we get this equation here. And we look at it, we were like, oh, this looks pretty good. And then we sort of notice this term over here, and we're like, oh, what's, what's this thing? So what is this thing? <laughs> this is turbulence. <laughs> That's turbulence, right? OK. So what is that thing? Well, it looks something like that, and that, <laughs> and that as well. <laughs> and apart from being a horrendous equation, we also notice that these terms here that are circled in red are actually things that we don't know. So we come up with an equation for something, and then we realize actually that in that equation is more unknowns that we don't know. So we forget about that. It's too hard. So the question is, how do we build a surface model for this thing? There are eight rules. They are closure, dimensional homogeneity, completeness, objectivity, realizability, universality, consistency with Vangelator theory, and empirical robustness. I can't go through all of them. Don't worry about the moon, we'll go through a couple of them. So the first thing is closure. What's closure? It means we can't use anything that we don't already know. So this is our Reynolds stress term, R, and we're just going to say that we're going to use the things that we do know about the flow to try and characterize this thing. So we might say R could be a function of viscosity, density, the velocity, the velocity gradient. But then we actually we get rid of viscosity because we say like mostly when you're talking about high Reynolds number of flows where turbulence is dominant, the viscosity is actually irrelevant, does nothing. Objectivity. Objectivity is, is the idea that it has to be frame defended. So if you're running past a wind tunnel, it's going to be the same turbulence level as if you're standing still. So in that sense, you actually can't use the velocity, but you can use the gradient. Well, sort of, to see. Then we, we actually need to add some information about the turbulence, because turbulence is it's not what every turbulence is the same, so we need to say something about it. So we have to introduce a length scale and a time scale. And we can do that in various ways, but one common way is to use the production, sorry, the turbulent kinetic energy and the dissipation. Don't worry about what they mean, it's not important. Dimensional analysis, so then we just use the Buckingham as you know it, or the Vash backing Buckingham theorem, um, to then break that down into non-dimensional groups. And we find out that this Reynolds stress thing is a combination of uh, K, Epsilon, and the velocity gradient. In 1999, they went back to this grad V tensor and had a look at it from objectivity again. Well, actually, they've been arguing about this all the time, but 999 actually came to a conclusion about it. And they realized that actually, if you break this into two parts, you get a symmetric part and an anti symmetric part. This part is objective. This part isn't. It's dependent on the rotational frame of reference. So, in that sense, they said, okay, well, we'll take the symmetric part and we won't worry about the anti symmetric part. And then someone said, hang on a second. What about for all of those flows where rotation matters, like for instance in turbine machinery? So they shot this, this one in as well. So they, created, they made a correction, which is correcting for the rotational frame to make it objective. And then you get this equation. So this is the equation. What does G look like? It's a function. You don't know what G looks like. What might G look like? These guys, <coughs> Deville and Gatsky, came up with the equation. It looks like this and that and that too. Forget it. <laughs> Quadratic models. We just take the first three terms, and these include the Reynolds stress models, the four equation model of the V2F, and the 13 equation of relaxation. Linear models, we just take the first term, we get k epsilon, k beta. First equation, one equation models, and zero equation models like missing length, 
and John Denver was saying he used the missing link, that doesn't even classify as rule three called com completeness, so it's, it's junk. No W, no W missing equation, no rotational effects. You can't use it in term machinery. It does not have relevance. Numerical robustness, number 10. Number of equations goes that way. How do you reckon the cost goes? That way too. Numerical robustness, the other way. If it's big, it's gonna fail. Accuracy, who knows? <laughs> what about compressibility or heat transfer? Haven't even touched it. Don't trust your endless models. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Mm-hmm.